Okay, Adina. Well, it's absolutely wonderful to have you here um, on Rahma with Rose. And I'm extremely excited to be able to talk to you about your healing journey. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here and to reconnect with you. Likewise. So I want to share before we start the conversation, how I know you and the amazing ways you've inspired me and why I wanted to invite you uh, to Rahma with Rose. Um, I used to live in Los Angeles where Adina lives or Pasadena, sorry, I, but I was in Los Angeles. Um, and we connected in various different circles. The LA Muslim community of people who are on the progressive side is pretty small. And so we interact in various uh, circles. Um, but specifically, the ones where you inspired me the most was in the Women's Mosque of America. Um, I'll never forget when it was the first uh, gathering of the Women's Mosque of America in 2015. I can't remember which month. Maybe you do. January. Yeah, and you gave the first, oh, in January, you gave the first khutbah, the first sermon. And I remember going into, it was a synagogue, going to the synagogue, into this room where I could go into the room and sit at the front of the room. That was just like mind blow. Like I couldn't, I couldn't conceive of sitting at the front of the room. You probably remember mm -hmm. that as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you and, and the leader was at the top on the stage I remember that giving this sermon and I first remember a woman I don't remember her name giving the azan the call to prayer and that sent shivers down my spine hearing a woman stand at the front of the mosque um, converted mosque from a synagogue calling the call to prayer the first time ever I've heard it called on that way and then you gave a sermon and it was a sermon of inspired leadership, really, of why we need to step up um, and to do the things that need to be done. And mm -hmm. I was so blown away by your sermon because you're al already a very inspiring leader in the LA Muslim community. And I had already learned a lot from you, but that moment was just uh, life-changing. And I listened very carefully and I listened so much and I remember you said, we need to step up and just do the thing we need to do, just take the action. And because of what you said, I decided to volunteer to give the second sermon. I don't even remember why or you know, what led me. I had no intention because I am not, I don't like public speaking, to be honest. And now I don't do a lot. I mainly speak in small, in groups, but I don't like sitting, I don't like standing at the front of the room and speaking. That's not my zone of genius, you can say. So I don't even know what led me to volunteer, except that you inspired me to do that, Adina. Um, but it was really powerful because I felt that I had something I wanted to share. Um, mm -hmm. And when I gave the sermon, it was supported by you. And this we grew, grew the spiritual lineage of women uh, giving the sermon at the Women's Mosque, especially that first year was so powerful in 2015 of the women powerhouses mm -hmm. who were giving sermon after sermon on really important topics that we've never heard in a mosque because we know what they usually focus on in mosque. And what we felt that year in the preceding the in the um, preceding years was just so uh, inspiring and so I'll never forget that moment and how you inspired me um, but what's more is you know I was also really a um, big part of Newground which is a Jewish Muslim cooperative organization to bring Jews and Muslims in different forms of dialogue and um, I was also active in giving talks and attending the events and I just absolutely adored that community to see the work that was happening it's very rare in the U.S to have an organization like New Ground, but then ultimately why, what led me to interview you and reach out for this uh, conversation is uh, we were both part of the American Muslim Civic Leadership Initiative. You had been one of the early um, members of it and it was an organization out of University of Southern California to train American Muslims in civic leadership. I joined later on, um, but we had a reunion in Oh God, was that 2017 maybe in Long Beach around then? And you led a workshop with Sada Jawade, who hopefully will also be a guest soon on this podcast. Mm -hmm. It was a workshop on healing, on, on recovering from burnout. I, I recall mm -hmm. that very um, vividly because I was in the middle of contemplating my marriage and soon left after actually amicably was one of the reasons why I ended up leaving an abusive marriage. It was very pivotal for me. Um, mm. And your workshop with Sada was so um, 
was very deep for me because I was in this process of recognizing that I felt broken. I wasn't broken, but I felt broken. And I didn't have people around me who were on this similar healing path. So when I went to your workshop and you just talked about some modalities, you talked about the body keeps a score, the very famous book that everyone knows now. I bought it for the first time and it took a long time to read that book because it's a dense book. And it was a lot of tears were involved with reading that book. So it was a very slow read. I remember you, you two talking about that book and just like the basics of healing. It was, mm -hmm. uh, but it was uh, something that Muslim community didn't talk about at that time in 2017, that academics weren't talking about. Mm -hmm. So all of that um, was very powerful. And then we reconnected later after I moved to Istanbul and you told me a little bit about your healing journey. And I was like, I need to invite Adina on this podcast because your story uh, needs to be heard. Um, you're a very accomplished woman in terms of your professional um, life and leaving behind a really beautiful legacy. But I also wanted people to hear the story of how, what it's like to go from being, as we were talking about earlier, a professional Muslim, uh, being a spokesperson for Islam in post 9-11 America, to mm -hmm. being someone who just is herself on this healing path. Um, so long story short, that's why I invited mm. you here. And I'm looking forward to this conversation. Me too, Rose. Me too. I, you've just brought me back on such a yeah deep memory journey. And I'm remembering that that reunion took place in 2019. Oh, 2019. I, bad. Yeah. Like, well, no, that's okay. Because I thought that was right. And then again, I'm like remembering all the things that took place huh. and it was right before COVID. It was one of those last things that took place and it was following the depth of my um, the physical manifestation of my burnout, which is why um, I remember it. I, yeah. that was at late 2018. And then okay. the following yeah. year when I was coming yeah. into the fullness of my yeah. healing journey, mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I did that workshop yeah. with, uh, with our friend, Sarah Jawaid. So yeah. yeah so four years ago, subhanAllah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Glory Thank you be. for that reminder. <laughs> With all that intensity in my life, I can't. All the years blend together, actually, and I think it's a form of PTSD. So I literally have no idea when anything happened. Me too. <laughs> I'm piecing it question. together. The slowing yeah. down has is the only way that I've been able to begin remembering. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Slowing down to begin to remember. Wow, that's a beautiful quote, Dita. Mm. Already. Great. So let's start. If we may, can you remember when in your life did you first get start getting interested in spirituality in general? Mm -hmm. um, so I do believe that it started when I was a child. I mm -hmm. was born into a Muslim family. My parents mm -hmm. are from the former Yugoslavia, where the country is now called Montenegro. Um, and it's right next to Croatia, uh, or right below Croatia, if you will. Um, and my parents, have, my family's been Muslim for generations, actually, yeah, through the Ottoman Empire. And my grandfather spent 10 years in Turkey. And mm -hmm. um, and so my parents um, had the, the faith spark, <clears throat> the spiritual spark in them. They were the ones in their family families who, yeah, who held it tight, but they didn't know much about uh, their faith um, because of, you know, the way it was practiced and taught culturally mm -hmm. and who held the knowledge as we all know. Um, and so for me growing up, when my parents moved here, I grew up in San Diego and um, I was always aware of God. I, my parents, I one of my earliest memories is my mom would um, read the Fatiha, the first chapter of the Quran to us in Arabic before we would go to bed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so my first spiritual memory out of that is that I would lay in bed at night and talk to God mm -hmm. um, in my head. And because my parents' uh, prayers were in Montenegrin or Serbo Croatian, mm -hmm. whatever language you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that God would only understand if I spoke in Montenegrin. And so in my, I was probably, I don't know, between six and eight. Um, and I remember being in bed and carefully trying to remember the words to use because while Montenegrin is my first language already by that point, mm -hmm. um, we were, you know, my sister and I were speaking English at home and yeah. And so, um, yeah, so that's my first like spiritual memory, mm -hmm. this, the intention of trying to connect. Um, mm -hmm. that's what I, that's what I place in it now. And, um, and then, and most of that faded away for most of my childhood. I found mm -hmm. I <laughs> I've come to realize that I was Islamophobic as a young person. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, because I fell into the media images and I didn't have Muslim friends. So I didn't really know other Muslims. We did, there weren't youth groups back then. I was 
Um, I came up in the eighties, late eighties, early nineties. Um, and yeah. And so it was really alienating. And so I, that only changed when I went to college at UCLA, my sister and I went together and she had the faith spark by that point in our family. And yeah. And we were walking on Bruin walk and saw a table that said Muslim student association. Mm. And my sweet sister Manira said, Hey, let's go check that out. Or she said something like that. Maybe I was the one that said that's weird, but, <laughs> and, uh, and so we went up to the table and the, per and we're in like our, you know, cut off shorts and, uh, you know, but, uh, Montenegrin modesty was a different, had a different standard than, than others. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one piece bathing suits was, was, was how it worked. Mm -hmm. Um, but so, yeah, but this person who was at the table didn't judge us, didn't, you know, again, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm starting with the, how they didn't treat us, but, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, after all this time thinking about the, it was the welcome, right? It was the openness mm -hmm. of the person on the other side of the table who said, oh, you should like come check it out. And, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, we're like, this is the things that we do that my wall, like just came, you know, came down so that at least I could see over the wall. Um, and that is what started my renewed spiritual journey because I actually met Muslims, um, especially women, mm -hmm. um, who were kind, who were smart, who were focused, who had like a vision for the future and who were grounded like it was, yeah, it was like, it was the, a package that I didn't expect. And so it was mm -hmm. Muslim women, including my sister and my current sister-in-law, um, who was one of my first roommates after my sister, um, that I felt because I fell in love with Muslim women is why I fell in love with Islam. Um, and why I gave the Quran another chance, which mm -hmm. I had never really read before. Um, and that is what started my spiritual journey. And it's also what inspired me to start wearing hijab the beginning of my second year in college mm -hmm. and why I continued to wear it for 25 years um, until January of last year um, is out of an in deep inspiration of, mm -hmm. yeah, of the, the, the women that I met and the spiritual connection that I could, the newer, the light I could see mm -hmm. in their faces because of the the spiritual connection they were nurturing. And so that is, yeah, that's, th those are the seeds of my spirituality. Um, and hijab for me was a choice around like not wanting to pass. I was so shy. And I think you and I can relate on this is at the time, you know, again, for, I would, I, I pass, right. Like as a European Muslim, um, and so wearing hijab was a way of forcing myself not to pass mm -hmm. and to honor Muslim women who I respected and also to force myself to talk about Islam, force myself mm -hmm. to be a public Muslim and boy, did it work. <laughs> um, yes. So I, um, yeah, so that's, that's a longer answer than, than just, yeah, where it all started, but there were these, yeah, there were definitely these stages. It started in my childhood, mm -hmm. but it really, it really took off when I was, um, at college. And again, to your point, like Muslim women were, the, uh, yeah. were what started it all. Yeah. I love hearing that how women, Muslim women were the ones who inspired you on that journey. And uh, I've had a few women tell me about their experiences in college being pivotal for them mm -hmm. and leading them on a path towards spirituality. So it's, it's interesting to see this pattern, right? Of mm -hmm. when we have this a little bit more freedom uh, away from our family, we can explore spirituality on our own terms, you know, with other mm -hmm. college students. So yeah. Well, and my sister ended up marrying the guy on the other side of the table two years later. And <laughs> my Wonderful. parents ended up becoming more religious and uh, Islam became the center of their lives. We were mm. yeah, in a, in a different space before then. Mm. And, you know, I mean, it's the, it's the domino effect of things. Mm. And my mother's voice reading me Fatiha mm. in childhood, um, it's full circle. She just passed yeah. away a few months ago. God, God rest her soul and eat a beautiful eternity. Um, and yeah, and that's what we were, we were doing with her and her mm. final moments. And so, mm. yes. And it's, it's all, it's all Muslim women. Oh, my condolences on the passing of your mother. I'm really sorry to hear about that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for being on after um, in your period of grief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how would you describe the spiritual path you're on now, either as a trajectory or your current mm -hmm. state? What does that look like? Um, I'm in a new, yeah, I'm definitely in a new mm -hmm. stage. As you described I was a professional Muslim, right? I, <laughs> um, 
I was the national, one of the national voices for the Muslim community post 9-11, especially from 2004 when I joined the Muslim Public Affairs Council mm -hmm. as the communications director until 2014 when I had my second child and decided that my, yeah, that I could not continue mm -hmm. to go through the burnout cycle. Um, uh, that, yeah, that I stepped away. Um, and Whew, white, sorry, I felt just fell right back into the memory. Ask me the question again. <laughs> you can sit with this for a moment if we just need to sit with this. You know, this is a show about embodiment too. So if you need sure to sit is. with this, maybe just sit what? with this for a moment mm -hmm. if you need to and see how it's like sitting with you. So the question was, it's, how would yeah. you describe the spiritual path you're on either as a trajectory or now? And you can just, let's just sit with it it's, if you need to. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, so the, I'll, let me describe the yeah. feeling. Because do. we love doing what that. washes over me when I think about those early days is this, mm -hmm. it's sort of a wave of heat that starts here and then mm -hmm. <laughs> it works its way down my body. And it's sort of like, yeah, it overcomes me. I, you know, mm -hmm. I said earlier about the starting to remember mm -hmm. these years, again, so many things mm -hmm. happened mm -hmm. so like each day of that period mm -hmm. of my life. Um, and so yeah, so it's 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 coming back together. So mm -hmm. I plunged myself into journalism after I graduated mm -hmm. from UCLA. I wanted to go into journalism and mm -hmm. broadcast journalism specifically since I was a child. Mm -hmm. I love storytelling. I love yeah, the hearing pe yeah, yeah people's stories, um, and everybody's got a story. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but by the and I was the editor of the Daily Brew in the campus newspaper at UCLA, and we were the top newspaper in the country. But then I graduated and was trying to get journalism jobs, mm -hmm. wearing hijab in 1999. Lo and behold, um, there was nothing for me, mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't I wasn't confident enough in myself to like mm -hmm. be the break barriers girl, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, so that was the my spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. God took me into a different direction that brought my talents and my desires mm -hmm. together because I, I mean, from wanting to be a broadcast journalist, mm -hmm. I ended up uh, serving the Muslim American community mm -hmm. as a spokesperson on the other side of the microphone than I expected, mm -hmm. which was terrifying to me. And that became part of my spiritual journey. It became mm -hmm. a core part of my spiritual journey mm -hmm. because as you described, I don't, I also, at that time, especially I didn't, uh, I wanted to be able to talk to people and I could do it in small groups, but talking mm -hmm. to big groups and talking, yeah, on a microphone and on a, you know, on camera, all of those things were, were impossible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was only because of the, the mentorship and the support mm -hmm. and the pushing of my mentor, Dr. Maher Hattut, mm -hmm. um, may God rest his soul with eternal beauty. He, um, he was one of the leaders of the Islamic Center of Southern California for decades. Mm -hmm. And um, it was he, it was him who recruited me after college. Um, I went to work at a Muslim and Islamic school um, because I was not sure what else to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I taught English and history for a year. And then they they heard about me and I got recruited to work for the Muslim magazine, the Minaret. Um, and I thought, OK, here it is. Here's my spiritual journey coming alive. I wanted to have a public mm -hmm. Muslim contribution. Mm -hmm. And I was asking God to put me in a place of service. Mm -hmm. And this was even before, yeah, in like 2000, before 9-11, like mm -hmm. open another door, another window for me. Mm -hmm. And Allah kept opening the door to Muslim <laughs> activism. And mm -hmm. it was um, a huge honor. And so stepping into the role of being a communications director felt like a spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. It felt immensely important. I felt immensely honored. And I also felt terrified every day because I didn't have the words and I was counting on the people around me to give me the words in these awful situations. I mean, so I was in the public, you know, on microphones, let's say, um, inside and outside of the community from 2004 mm -hmm. until 2017, really. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe that's why 2000, yeah, 2017 was that Trump year um, mm -hmm. that re really started to break me up, break me down from yep. the inside out. Um, that, yeah, that it was, um, it was a spiritual journey to show up for Allah in public in a way that would be documented and continue to live on on the internet, if no other place, and to know that I was one of few Muslim voices mm -hmm. that were out there. And also to know that so often the opportunities that I was getting were, or at least to feel, to suspect mm -hmm. that so, so often the opportunities I was getting was because I was a white European mm -hmm. Muslim without an accent and blue mm -hmm. eyes, um, mm -hmm. and that I'm relatable and all of these things. And so mm -hmm. just that 
the positioning was both a blessing and mm-hmm. also an immense responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, and I felt the need to be an extra professional Muslim mm-hmm. inside of my community to prove mm-hmm. myself because I was in my mm-hmm. late twenties. I mean, so from, you know, uh, 2004, yeah, I was in, I was think I was 26 or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so the, the, it, I threw my whole self in it. And every day before I walked into the office, I remember I would, as I would put my hand on the doorknob, I would say, Ya Allah, please help me to be useful. Ya Allah, mm-hmm. please help me to be useful today. Let me to be useful in your cause. Um, and that was, yeah, that's what kept me together. But what fell apart during that time was my salah, my, my mm-hmm. five daily prayers, not all at once, you know, it never does. Um, but the wearing hijab and serving Islam in public became my salah, uh, in some way. And I, and it, and I don't know that I was okay with it, but that's, that, that's what I'm looking back now. Uh, so that part of my spiritual journey, my work was mm-hmm. my, became my offering mm-hmm. to Allah and every like, yeah, like putting on hijab and going to work every day. It wasn't the hijab that was the work, but it was all of it. Like my, every part of my being was to serve Allah. Um, yeah, every day. And that was such a gift and such an immense responsibility because mm-hmm. there was, a, there were so few of us, mm-hmm. there were so few of us and so little infrastructure and all of those organizations you mm-hmm. described that we helped create, mm-hmm. we created because they weren't there and we needed them. And we were so ill-equipped and I felt so alone. And I knew that other Muslims around the country who were doing their best, just like me, and were in a younger mm-hmm. generation, um, probably felt the same and that we sh- that dear God, we shouldn't be alone. And that sense of aloneness is what I went to Allah with. Um, and I, yeah, my spiritual journey was a lot about asking Allah during those times. Um, where is my safe space? Where is my community? Um, and where can I truly be myself? Because I mm-hmm. felt that I had a public responsibility and my spiritual, my, prof- you know, this mm-hmm. professional Muslim terminology, mm-hmm. um, it was not a fake one. It was that, yeah, that I would be not the best Muslim, but be a representative. And that is an immense amount of pressure. Um, and so, yeah, I, my, where am I now spiritually? Um, I just, I just, I, I just want to say ahead. one thing. Please. When you mentioned the prayer you said every day and the very work you're doing as your practice of Islam, I was like, oh, <laughs> I wasn't the only one. I was like, I said the exact same prayer every day as a professor of mm-hmm. Islam. It felt like activism to teach young minds that Muslims are not terrorists, that they're humans and we're, mm-hmm. we're regular humans who live everyday lives. Like that was our jihad for so many years. Oh my gosh. I just like, when you said that my whole body had like these shivers going down because like, Ugh. oh, I thought it was just me, but oh, there's others who also like, it felt oh, like Rose. it was my actual practice of Islam was representing Muslims, which how did we think we could represent 1.8 billion, 2 billion people? But we oh my God. We but Rose, we did it. We did it. Like that's the thing looking back now. I mean, we, what I, the overwhelm of those days was waking up and not knowing what the day was going to bring. Mm-hmm. I, for me and my role as communications, especially, um, and those years, 2004, really to 2014, when I left from the full-time position, mm-hmm. um, it was a, a crisis a week, if not, if not more yeah. than that. And Always condemning we were dealing, right? well, we were dealing with, uh, international terrorism. And then we were also dealing with domestic terror mm-hmm. plots and we were dealing with all of this stuff within the community. And so while we were talking about Islam, we also had to deal with what some Muslims were doing mm-hmm. in this internal, like internal, mm-hmm. external, mm-hmm. and also then showing up in front of audiences, like mm-hmm. you as students mm-hmm. and not knowing, Ya Allah, what is the question going to be today? What is the thing that's going to come out of somebody's mm-hmm. mouth? And, and that I had to teach myself. I, I, I would often talk about how the hardest place to be Muslim for me was in the grocery store. This is my classic story because when I'm at work or when I'm in an event, I know that I'm on, mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, I'm ready. I have made my dua. I am, or at least I, you know, I'm, I'm more prepared because I'm in that professional mode. But when I'm at the grocery store and when I would wear hijab and somebody would say, excuse me, excuse me was my trigger in public spaces. I would, I learned to, if in the beginning, it would just be sort of my body would freeze. I'm a, I'm a freeze person in the, in the uh, flight, flight, Mm -hmm. fight, flight, freeze. Mm -hmm. Um, And over the years, I taught myself when I would hear, excuse me, that my reaction would be a deep breath. 
And then as I was turning around or as I was focusing in on the person, because I was acknowledging, here we go again, and then releasing that so that it would be a fresh encounter every time. But I had to teach myself that because who knows what the question would be that somebody would ask. And why do you wear that on your head or going into multi-faith audiences? And, you know, like, why aren't Muslims, uh, uh, marching in the streets against uh, against terrorism. Why haven't you guys condemned uh, terrorism? Where are the moderate Muslims? Like the absurdity mm-hmm. um, was so high, and the the lack of belief in our truth, like mm-hmm. that we had to prove that we were even telling the truth, yeah. that we were adequate representatives, and that was part of what I really I inter- not internalized, but I took really seriously was I'm a young European woman, and I when especially I'm in public places, why will these people believe me over, you know, somebody who's in a thobe and, you know, has an accent and is male, for example, like it's this, yeah, like, oh, it's nice what you're saying, but you're the exception. And so over the years, really working to say, yeah, to really own my, own my spiritual truth, Mm -hmm. own my, I used to say that we didn't own our authority, credibility, or truth. Mm -hmm. That anywhere we went, we were, we had to prove our authority, Mm -hmm. our credibility, and that what we were saying was even true. (laughs) Like even you as an academic and an expert, right? Even me, I was, when I went into media spaces, I realized that I was invited as an advocate, not as an analyst, not Mm -hmm. as an expert. And that it's, these are different frameworks. Mm -hmm. And so all of that yeah, it was part of my daily spiritual battle. And I really became close to Allah at that time, even though I was further away from my rituals. Um, mm-hmm. And I became closer to my Muslim sisters, my mm-hmm. non-work Muslim mm-hmm. sisters, um, where I could be my authentic self um, and where I could really vent um, mm-hmm. and really talk about the things that were hurting me mm-hmm. um, and not be, you know, the professional Muslim. That's like, you know, again, always trying to work against the yeah. stereotype, but to acknowledge all the complexity and the the bullshit that was happening behind the scene inside of our community and outside of it. And the absurdity of the kinds of questions that we would get asked in public and have to maintain our composure. I was prized for my composure and that came out of trauma. I, well, it's, you know, that was part of what I realized during that, uh, in my healing journey to jump ahead a little bit is that the very things that I was prized for and that allowed me to do my job and hopefully do it well, um, were the direct product of, of my mm-hmm. complex uh, p- uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's really, um, yeah. And so now today mm-hmm. it took me, I think during COVID and after my body fell apart, um, around 2018 mm-hmm. and I had to really, um, yeah, go on this journey. Um, I really had to ask myself what's authentic to me, what's public and what's private. And part of the reason, well, a big, the main reason I decided to retire my hijab was because it was, it was supposed to be a tool for the prayer rug. Mm. It was, you know, like it's the, it's supposed to be a tool for the rug. It's supposed to be for me. I, it's supposed to be a tool again, to bring me closer to Allah. And mm. I have, I have lost the rituals, right? Like wearing hijab became my salah Mm -hmm. um, for me. And Mm -hmm. so I, and I no longer felt authentic with it. And I, it was, uh, you know, and I, had you know, like men, like all, I think all women who wear hijab, I had gone through like so many burnouts, so many chapters of wearing Mm -hmm. hijab. um, But I, and I had stepped away from my, my public Muslim life. And so it was the first time that I really even allowed myself the permission the Mm self-permission to decide if it was something that continued to serve me. Mm -hmm. And I decided that I wanted to focus on returning to my prayer rug with Mm -hmm. the scarf and that, yeah. And that it had served its, it had served its job, Mm -hmm. which was, it has made me talk about Islam and talk about being Muslim (laughs) every day for 25 years. And I'm trained now. And I, so I still talk about Islam and Muslims every day now, and I've just moved my symbols to my jewelry. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, and that Allah is on my tongue. Um, and then I'm still working on getting back to the to the prayer rug on a regular basis. Um, and so that's where I am today. I'm, I'm okay. so deeply connected to Allah and I've retired my public symbol of Islam. And that was really, it took me about a year and a half. I mean, I decided 
probably year 22 and a half around. Yeah. Around 29, 2020, I think deep into COVID mm -hmm. is when I decided. And I, that's when I decided that I would retire it at 25 years. Um, and subhanAllah again, in divine timing, um, the very month, the September, 2021, which was my 25th anniversary was also the beginning of residency that I was offered at UCLA, which is my mm -hmm. alma mater, right? The mm -hmm. uh, residency with the mm -hmm. UCLA Islamic studies program and the dollar museum um, to, uh, to a community scholar in residence to look at issues that I wanted to. And that was the, like, again, the time, subhanAllah, the timing of, I felt like, okay, Allah, like God was, mm -hmm. Yeah, putting putting my decision to the test is will you go through with this or not? Because I was I felt like I was coming back into a public-ish place. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I so I delayed the I delayed the retirement for six months um, to process these new feelings and this this mm -hmm. reconciliation between all the all the adenas that have been and all the adenas that are still waiting to become. Um mm -hmm. And, and so it was back at the UCLA campus <laughs> in yeah. SubhanAllah that I, yeah, that I retired my hijab. And so it's been about a year and a half now. Um, and I feel, yeah, I feel content spiritually and I feel a deeper sense of ownership. And it's also been really interesting to detangle my mm -hmm. spiritual relationship mm -hmm. from my work, like from the day to day of my work, I'm still doing Muslim work and I'm looking mm -hmm. at the history of Muslims in Los Angeles now. Um, and I'm seeing again, still doing storytelling and getting, mm -hmm. you know, like it's full circle. Um, but it's not, again, I'm not, I'm not in the public eye, um, in the way that I used to be. And that's, um, that's so comfortable and it's so gratifying because there are so many voices now. I felt yeah. like you, I felt so much pressure. I'm assuming like you had so much pressure to stay put and have yeah. staying power because so much had been invested in me and there were so few of us. Exactly. We couldn't afford to step away. Like that was, uh, that felt like spiritual betrayal. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so I, 25 years, 26, I don't know what it's been now. Um, yeah. I'm, I am finding a new spiritual chapter, especially as a mother. Um, and yeah, I'm thinking about this next stage of my life. Well, I feel just honored to hear that story. And I love how you talk about retiring your head job. It reminds you of like how athletes retire their numbers, right? That's like the, the close analogy I can think of. And, and it feels that like you, you decide to give up that professional Muslim identity and just be you authentically, which is so hard because mm -hmm. like you said, all these those of us who were active in um, fighting against Islamophobia for Muslim rights and awareness about Islam in the United States post 9 in America, our identity was so personal and professional identity were so intertwined. It was like, where does it start and begin? That was my challenge, right? That was like one of the reasons why I enjoy living outside the U.S. is because I just don't get those questions in the grocery store anymore. Like no one asks me about my clothing or about any of that. I don't have to have those conversations about Islam anymore because everyone is at least somewhat nominally Muslim or exposed to Islam. And I just don't have those conversations. I can go much deeper now. Right. Um, in the U.S. is so hard to go deeper. Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit easier now, but it's still it's still a very primitive level of like knowledge about Islam and who Muslims are. So it's just lovely to hear how you're like in this new chapter of of coming into your own. And this is exactly what we're focusing on this podcast is women coming to their own, finding who they actually are, apart from all the other things you've been involved with. And it's so beautiful to mm -hmm. see you finding yourself. Um, and on your healing journey, you mentioned a little bit of kind of what helped you. You mentioned when your body fell apart and this journey, <laughs> would you be willing to share like how yeah. did how and when did you start walking this healing journey specifically? There's spirituality and there's the healing path, which many of us entered much later on in our lives, unfortunately. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Um so I only started my healing path, yeah, when my body fell apart mm -hmm. and I made it through a good 13, 14. No, actually from 2000 until 2018, I will give myself credit. I made it through 18 years <laughs> of professional uh, activism in one form or another and public mm -hmm. Muslim life and, and, and service mm -hmm. um, that included 
at least three or four burnouts that I can think of. And that was part of what I documented during and shared during that workshop at the American Muslim mm-hmm. Civic Leadership Institute mm-hmm. um, or initiative, I know Institute. Um, and that was the one of the hardest things I've ever done was mm-hmm. to admit to my peers mm-hmm. how many times I had broken mm-hmm. and had to put myself back together. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. And what had come, what had come as a result. So, you know, the, the burnouts at work were exhaustion, right. It was just, yeah, going, 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 going. And yeah. And then, you know, points where I just couldn't go anymore. And then I had to uh, fall apart and take a week off or do what, you know, exactly. It was like temporary mm-hmm. healing. And until I got pregnant with my second child in 2013, four, yeah, 2014. And I knew deep inside of me that this was the time Mm -hmm. to make a different choice Mm -hmm. that I had been able to keep going, going, going with my first child. I just like strapped him on and (laughs) kept going. And, and it was a blessing to be able to like, that was part of my service was to, as thinking about my sisters, like I, yeah, like I wasn't sure that I was even going to be a mom. I wasn't sure that that was something I wanted. And I, when I, my husband and I chose to have children, I was like, all right, well, then we're going to do this differently. I'm not going to like slink into the background. I'm not, you know, like, I'm not Mm going to separate myself. Mm -hmm. And I, so yeah, so I just kept going, but I knew inside of myself that with another child, I, I couldn't do the same. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I used that as my opportunity um, during maternity leave to really think about whether, yeah, whether I could go back um, mm-hmm. or not. And those intense feelings of guilt, guilt, guilt <laughs> really um, overwhelmed me. And mm-hmm. even though I knew what I needed to do, how could I tell the people that I worked with, uh, including my mentor who was mm-hmm. uh, deeply ill at the time? Um, yeah, what I, that I was choosing myself, that I was choosing my yeah. family. And it's, you know, I, I know I'm not alone in that, but it felt, it almost felt like a contradiction to my activist life, like in the vision I had for myself. And um, so, yeah, so I thought that by making the choice to slow down and just not just focus on being a mother, but yeah, slow down mm-hmm. and, um, and do something else and redesign my professional life so that it would be on my terms and I could be like a consultant mm-hmm. and help work with different Muslim organizations. Cause that's what I wanted at that point. Yeah. Um, is uh, yeah, I thought that that would be enough to initiate my healing. Oh boy, it didn't. Um, so I, and to, so I was pushing along and feeling pain in my back feeling some pain in my neck. Like there was just aches and pains. My, and my, well, the first sign was my thyroid. <clears throat> After I had my first child, uh, I became hypothyroid and I, I'm pointing at this cause I developed a goiter, um, on my thyroid, which later, as I started to do exploration, all of this stuff in your throat, as we know, right. What is my tool? What is my tool been? It's all been about voice. Yeah. Right. And also about your what we're talking, chakra. right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And like what you're holding back, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. Holding my tongue, biting my tongue. We have a, my family motto, my sister and I joke because our family motto was uh, which means grit your teeth is the this is the national identity of of people from the former Yugoslavia it's grit your teeth right it's like it's double down it's it's yeah it's suck it up it's all of that and when you hold your tongue right where does it go and so my thyroid fell apart first and so I my energy level the fog just the slowness the fatigue the it was yeah that was intense and then I, I got uh well, eczema dryness and all this, like my, it it was showing up on my face and in this, like, again, in the spiritual, spiritual interpretation that I, that I'm deeply in is subhanAllah. Like I, that's the, it was in my body. That's why I described these other sensations Mm -hmm. I was having, but I could ignore all of that. I had become so used to ignoring my body because I had to use my brain and get the words out and serve the people. Right. (laughs) So they had to fill my role that I, I could just be as my sister, my, my friend and I say, it's like a brain on a stick, right? Mm-hmm. Like this, this part of me is not 
not, don't worry about this part, right? Like this is all, this is all you need. Um, and so I could keep pushing. And so that this dryness showed up on my face, right? Like that I couldn't ignore it. And I was lost part of my eyebrow. I was getting all this. Yeah. It was like a deep eczema. I couldn't figure out what was going on. Then went to the doctor, got tested, realized that it was connected to my thyroid, started medication that only did so much. I was hoping the medication was going to bring back my energy levels. I couldn't get my energy levels back. And having two children at that point, I just felt increasingly fatigued. Um, and yeah. And then depression and then uncertainty. And then, and then Trump got elected and I, we all remember that. My God, I, you know, it was really the biggest somatic response. Like this every, I, and now I can look back on it and feel like, I think that what happened is that I had been holding it all right. Like it's mm -hmm. all worth it. It's all going to pay off. Like mm -hmm. again, it's this, like the, the arc of the universe, right. What they say is the arc of moral justice is long, right. But it bends towards justice. And it like, I didn't see it coming. And I didn't even realize that it was like, that it broke, you know, and not that it broke me, but I felt mm. a brokenness, like something inside of me, the promise that I had, like the spiritual promise I had lived with mm -hmm. somehow broke. And mm. I, yeah, that's when I, I, I really, I realized I was in trouble. Um, that's a, kind of the way to put it is I was working in coalition with a small group of Muslims on behalf of a bunch of Muslim organizations to help create a crisis response system after all these years among mm -hmm. Muslim organizations. And that was extremely challenging. Then we went into action after Trump got elected. And I put like, I just went right back into that full-time mode and threw myself into it. And then we came into 2017. I decided to do a podcast to start to reclaim my personal voice because I had been speaking for we for so long for us. And I needed, I wanted to reclaim the I, I had, there had been no I in mm. so much of that work. It was only later as I realized and owned the power of personal storytelling and personal mm. narrative through places like Ampli, um, that I even incorporated my story into, you know, into the work, um, and so, yeah, so the podcast, um, you know, it's why I respect so much what you're doing. The, my podcast was called Meeting the Moment, and I wanted it to be a place where I could share my stories of meeting the moment, um, <clears throat> which is finding opportunities within crises, which is what I learned through my, my activism. Um, and the most terrifying part of that podcast was the first two minutes when I would tell a personal story. Um, because it was so unfamiliar to me. And the whole journey in 2018, I think I did the podcast for about six or eight months. <clears throat> it, um, I realized even listening to them now, that I was so concerned with like perfect, per, not perfection, but like presentation. Right. Yeah. And I wanted uh, every um to be edited out. I want, you know, I wanted it to sound so professional, which it wasn't sounding like me. Right. And so this, I can see how 2018 was this pivotal year where I was trying to figure out how to be me and what me, who me is, who, what I can share about me and what I can remember about me and what vulnerability I can begin to share. <clears throat> And I stopped working I, my, well, while I was doing the podcast, my husband and I, I asked him, can you be the breadwinner <laughs> so that I can just do this? Like, I don't, I, I don't, I only put, when I have multiple things, my projects go on the back burner, right? It's the self-sacrifice, codependency, all of it, um, trauma response. And so I was like, let me, I need to clear field so that this is like the thing I'm doing. And we agree and yeah, we agreed to that. And then a couple of months later, he got, he got bit by a flea in our backyard and it gave him some virus and he ended up in the hospital oh subhanallah and uh, alhamdulillah he was okay but it was like a very touch and go situation for like a day and then he was unable to work for a little while and I that was the fight like I, I tell you this whole long story because yeah. I could handle all the professional mm -hmm. things when it came home and I no longer had like a job to fix the problem and I didn't, couldn't control his health and I couldn't. Yeah. Like, again, I like all my, my zone of influence yeah. disappeared is when, and that became the time where, because he, yeah, I was like, okay, he's like, get it. You know, he's going to be back to work and he's getting healthier and everything. It wasn't like a long-term issue, but our finances fell apart. 
and because uh, he's self-employed and I yeah, was the, uh, a consultant and not working at that point. And we had savings, but again, everything fell apart and I didn't want to ring the bell for him. I didn't want to mm-hmm. tell him that I was scared because he was just recovering in his own health. Yeah. Now, and so what happened next is that my back uh, and my sciatica, uh, my, my, the body keeps the score and my body started to talk. Um, And that's what I have learned is that the more I, yeah, if we stuff it down, we stuff it down. I can take it. I can take it. Oh yeah. First time it showed up on my face. Right. (laughs) And this time I was having, yeah, over the course of that summer, I started having some lower back pain and I would like, remember we would sit on our back stairs at night and look at the stars and I would get up and I couldn't quite stand up straight. I was like, Oh, and that I, but I let that go on for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. I just, (laughs) it'll get better. It'll get better. I'll walk. Right. Until one day I sat down on the couch and I had a shooting pain from my left hip all the way down my left leg, pretty much. And I got up and I'm like, that's weird. And I tried to find another comfortable position. And it, every time I sat down from that point on, I had this shooting pain. Long story short, I lost my ability to drive. Like this was from, yeah, I want to say October, 2018 to, and again, it was getting progressively worse until I couldn't drive. And that was, my body fell apart. And that was when I decided I needed to do something because I didn't want to spend money. I didn't have money. Like we were like trying to deal with our finances. Everything's uncertain. We're parenting, right? that lack of control to like deal with our own life scared me more than anything else. Right. Like I found, I found my wall and I was unwilling to admit I was, I was afraid to my husband and the body keeps the score. And so what I, it, I developed sciatica that was debilitating. I lost my ability to drive and I had to, and I couldn't figure out how I had done this to myself. I kept being everybody. Like, I was like, well, did I lift my son? Did I like, again, I was looking for physical reasons. Mm-hmm. Like how had this happened? How did I injure my back? Right. Like where did it, it was such a trip. And then a friend said, sent me an article, a link to an article that described how sciatica was often an emotional uh, had emotional roots. Um, and that it even pinpointed finances as one of the, um, one of the, yeah, one of the kinds of fears or, you know, yeah, uncertainties, um, and fears that can come up. And so I was so in denial and it just all made me so mad, (laughs) made me so mad. Um, and because I was like, I don't, I, I can't afford to fix myself, but if I'm not working, nothing else works. And subhanAllah, again, it was the, that was my rock bottom because I didn't want to spend money on myself. I didn't want to, I kept going to the doctor and they, what I was told was it'll heal on its own between six and nine months. I cried and cried and cried. I was at a point where, again, I wasn't driving. I could only sleep for an hour and a half at a time because I couldn't. You tell me the doctors had no. They had no solution. They gave me a, they gave me a pain shot, right? Like at some point in my hip and, but it was not again, like this is, I would say it in this long way because it was not purely physical. Mm -hmm. Like what I was so, like I realizing that the doctors couldn't help me (laughs) like was this oh my god Mm -hmm. I it's I have to save my own life like I have to do like it that was my rock bottom was I am not waiting six or nine months like right like how am I like how can I make that how can I heal be heal this faster Mm -hmm. because again I was it like ruined my life I was it I can't you can't even describe anyway so with no money, <laughs> I start. I first went to acupuncture. Um, I remember it was Thanksgiving of that year, and I went to acupuncture and paid one hundred and twenty-five dollars for an hour of acupuncture, and like cried that I was spending the money, and cried that I was in so much pain, and I was like weeping from the pain of even just laying there, and let alone everything. But it gave me just the first bit of. It gave me even 30 minutes of relief. And at that point I was like debilitated. And so, and then a friend said, you know what, go see my body worker. She does um, acupressure and craniosacral, um, which is about like uh, the fluids between, you know, between things. Um, 
and yeah, and your vagus nerve and all this stuff. And I'm like, what the what? But I'm in so much pain that I'm desperate, right? So <laughs> I go to, uh, yeah, I take two, two metros to go see this woman. And she begins to like, uh, yeah, work on my body. And she's pushing around my torso. And she pushes on my lower belly, top of my pelvic bone. And I scream. And she says, she takes a pause and she says, how old were you? And then like, and that's the beginning of the rest of my journey and which I, I knew exactly what she meant. And she was right. I, uh, which was that, how old were you when you were, uh, violated, molested, um, abused, um, and, I, I was like, uh, like I felt so exposed and confused. Um, and I said, and I could said to her, I think, you know, I was a young child. I think I was between five and it was seven, something like that. And I, this is not what I expected to come in here for. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I, I thank God I can, I can laugh with, uh, this is just the stuff, like, again, the stunning things, just entering the journey of addressing my physical pain uncovered these other things. And this woman began to work on my body and my soul at the same time. And like, became kind of not even a therapist, but like a, we talked through those stories and all the stuff that was going on in there. And that's when I began to make this connection to the body keeps the score. How could she put, just push on a plate, you know, like not even intensely push on a place in my body Right. And no. And that like idea again, that the body keeps the score and what is everything that's been trapped. And like, it just came together in this moment around, Oh, it is emotional pain and Oh my God. And so many things. And so it was the beginning of the healing journey because I realized that everything I had gone through was still in there and that I don't know that I had to begin to face that, um, and go back to the beginning. Um, because my professional activism in so many ways was about fighting for my little girl fighting for my, you know, my little Adina, um, and, you know, all the ways in my, my childhood and my extended family and my direct family that I, yeah, didn't feel like I could stand up for myself and, um, and yeah, God bless my family. It wasn't anybody in my direct family who, uh, was my abuser, but, um, it, I never told anybody at that point. I hadn't, I mean, my family, I hadn't told my family. I told my, my best friend and my close friends. Um, but this was also around the me too time, right? The me too uh, era. And again, so again, the, the convergence of so many things, it was like a volcano. That's the only thing I can describe is it's just so many factors that, led me to my rock bottom where I could no longer ignore these things and throw myself into work until that point, right? Like anytime I was uncomfortable, I could just go back to work. Like work made more sense than other things. And, um, yeah, so I, I spent, yeah, I, I went to that woman every week for the next six months. And even though I couldn't drive and she was on the other side of town and my life slowed down completely when, and I came to learn, I, I have come to believe that when we don't lay down, Allah will lay, lay us down, yes. that I was unwilling to slow down and face it all. And that this pain stopped me in my tracks and it forced me to slow down. And I spent a lot of time with myself and a lot, like a lot of time with myself. Um, and that, yeah. And so when you talked about the body keeps the score, it was while I was taking the Metro, once or twice a week, all the way from Pasadena to Santa Monica, because that's where my my body oh, worker was. Uh huh. So again, an hour each way. Like I'm, my husband is making fun of me because I'm taking an hour metro, like walking to the metro, taking because I can't sit down, right? So I'm standing on the on the metro. Um, yeah, taking this long journey to Santa Monica and then walking and then getting the treatment and then doing it all back. Like it was like a four or five hour thing. And I'm like, well, I don't, I can't do anything else anyway. Like this is, it's not like I'm wasting my day. I don't, I can't even like, I couldn't physically think straight enough to work. Like it was just parenting. So I, that's when I listened to the body keeps the score. 
I, uh, that's when I started to try to figure out what the hell is happening here. Like what is going on inside of me and how do I begin to take this apart? I also, and I read a book called parenting from the inside out that made me realize that attachment styles from childhood and childhood trauma and all these things, right. We're all connected. And so I, it was just all these things were beginning to, I was beginning to be exposed to myself. Mm-hmm. And then I went into the, yeah, I went into therapy deep and, and hardcore as well. I did so many, I did acupuncture therapy, the body worker. I was, th- I vitamins and supplements. I was doing everything possible to try to m- accelerate this healing journey. And it did end up, I, so the first, let me think, October to March was, I was able to get the pain down. So that was like five months. So I'd shortened, I was, that was my goal is to shorten those eight or nine months. Um, and then I had this, like, uh, it was the false confidence. I was like a month or two where I was good. I was good. And I kind of threw myself back at everything, right? False confidence. And it came back. And that again, it was like these, this is how Allah spoke to me. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this is so, so, you know, it's like, again, if you, uh, I'm like, this is why I'm like the body talk, you know, the body, my body kept talking to me and that's my, that is what I be, have become more connected to. Oh, I also, what tools that I've been used. I also started going to Kundalini yoga a long time ago, but I doubled down during this time because the stretching and the breathing, I realized through my body worker that I like my vagus nerve was, you know, was, was the problem. And I had to, and the, that freeze response is what was happening. Like this was just the ultimate freeze response is that my body was freezing. And it, that's what sciatica was, is that the, like the, the vagus nerve was caught in there because of the freeze. And so I was just again, like for the first time, I felt like I was in my body is the shortest way I could describe all of this. It was the first time that I was acutely aware of my body and that I was no longer a brain on a stick Mm -hmm. and it was that extreme. Um, and there's no going back. I mean, everything I do now is in service of my future self, because what I realized I was 40, 43 at the time, maybe I'm 46 now, um, 42 that like, this is my midlife realignment, my midlife reawakening. It's not just a crisis. It's a wake up. And if I, if I'm at the halfway point in my life, like I, this is a a calling and an invitation to like realign myself for the second half, because what I have been doing, right? Like what I have been doing has been in survival and in service, right? And in hustle and improving and in growing and in like, right. But like, just, and now Inshallah, if I am blessed with this being the beginning of my second half, inshallah, what, yeah, like, what do I leave? What do I take? What do I leave behind? And what do I reclaim? Um, And I decided I wanted to reclaim little Adina and let her speak and really fall in love with her and bring her forward. Um, Because I had, yeah, I had, I did not talk about my childhood to many people little yeah uh and yeah and so yeah so I stepped back into myself and it's been it's been a beautiful journey I stopped doing the podcast um because I was in so much pain and I wasn't ready to tell people right so it was uh so that's why I can remember now that it you know I had to I got through the second bout by summer. And then that's when my our mutual friend Samaya Abu Bakr, who was the managing yeah, who's the engine of AMCLE, the American Muslim Civic Leadership Institute for a decade. Um, she was suggesting to me that I bring my story to the AMCLE reunion. And we just said burnout. And to me, it was like it was the burnout workshop. Like, and I'm like, oh God, Samaya, I'm not I like really, like really, like I, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure that I'm ready to talk about it because I had just I had withdrawn so that I could just focus on myself and talking about it beyond safe people was so hard. Like mm-hmm. the tears were always just right under the surface. Um, but it was a leap of faith because I just like in 2006, before we started Ampli and new ground, I knew that other people were feeling what I was feeling. I just knew it. And I didn't want anybody to feel as alone and as 
without tools and as helpless as I felt like I had to save, I felt really truly like I had to save my, save my own life. And I didn't want other people to feel that way. Um, and so that's why I agreed to give that workshop. And it was the most terrifying thing I've ever done um, publicly because talking about all the bullshit is so much easier. <laughs> Yeah. talking to Bill O'Reilly about, yeah, about, uh, bullshit is so much easier than talking about my, my, my body turning on me and not turn, you know, it's so sad, even I'm trying to work on that language, but my, my body really waking me up to, yeah. um, everything it was carrying, yeah. um, and waking me up to myself, like enough, Adina, enough. Yeah. Like well, Dina, yeah. as someone who was there, I can say that it resonated so strongly with me and it really mm -hmm. helped me wake up to, to hear two really powerful leader, women leaders in the community telling it like it was and just mm -hmm. explaining like what happened, what, mm -hmm. um, what they needed to change their lives, what went wrong, you know, and I don't know if any other people came around and shared with um, you what they took away, but it was such a powerful session. I mean, I've been to mm -hmm. many workshops in my life, but that one definitely stands out, you know. Um, and, it was for me too, because yeah. this was like, well, I mean, wasn't there like 50, 75 people there? It was quite um, large, I think, because everyone was feeling, feeling burnt out. Well, so exactly. It just workshop. really, that's the thing. I mean, it's a, uh, it, it was in the air. And especially because we were years into Trump by that point, like it was, again, like when we just think about everything that we've been through and yeah, and these younger generations. And so, um, it was such a gift because many people, women and men, um, reached out to me from that group and to be that vulnerable for in front of my peers who many of them I knew looked up to me, you know, you know, uh, like it, um, yeah, it, it was, we were. So someone who, you know, who's at the workshop and, and I was really moved by, um, your authenticity of you mm -hmm. and Sara just telling it like it was because I was also at the end of my burnout as a professor and mm -hmm. I hadn't contemplated leaving at that point but I was so burnt out and I didn't know it and I also had physical health issues and I was also going to healers and you know doing all the same things and just to know there's others like myself in in leadership position was really impactful for me and as I'm listening to you tell the story of you know, how your body broke down. And then as you started to heal, like, oh, wow, I felt, I felt very tight in my chest. I was like, I could just like feel that, like those challenges, right? Like the financial challenges of, that's why I had to leave the United States because financially it wasn't viable to stay in the United States as a single mother, literally, you know, um, like how, when you didn't have a job, your husband got sick, how all of us are so, um, can so quickly lose our lives, um, you know, the, the current status of our lives, just with like a uh, succession of, of incidents, medical issues, losing a job, mm -hmm. everything, we can lose everything. It's mm -hmm. also a reminder of tawakkal, of, of why we need to depend on God. But so I just kind of felt that all my body, mm -hmm. like it tightened up. I wonder how you felt that telling this story, especially because I know you haven't shared it too much. How mm -hmm. did it feel to tell, tell that story? It's, it feels really sad. Um, I, talking about that time, my body goes back to that time. And mm -hmm. I, I often disassociate, right? Like I lose myself and go back to that place and kind of, it's sometimes hard to talk about that time because mm -hmm. yeah, I just sort of sink back into that time. And I remember, oh my God, I cried so much. I cried every day. I cried every day. Mm -hmm. And just from pain, from sadness and like the, the pain pain is a cause of depression. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, and the connection I felt to anybody in chronic pain, the connection I felt to my mother who had been in like chronic pain for mm -hmm. most of her life, the, the guilt I felt around not having compassion for people before to really, you know, like, again, until you feel deep physical pain, like every moment, there's just nothing like it. Right. Like, and so I, it just changed my orientation to life. I'd be walking down the street and I would see somebody limping and I would like physically feel connected to them. Right. Like spiritually, my, I, that empathy link was, Oh, like my heart goes out to you. Right. Like just the, I, the fullness of myself began to develop, but oh my God, that time I have never felt more vulnerable going through it. And then standing up in front of my peers, people I respected and admired to say like, I couldn't, I could no longer do it. It, even though I knew it was an act of courage, it felt 
<laughs> like an act of weakness, right? Because we get the grit your teeth, stay strong. We're activists, right? Like persevere all the mm. Islamic messaging around, you know, yeah, exactly. Like, uh, yeah. just she had an patient perseverance, like, one yeah. patient perseverance. Right. Yeah. And I believe in yeah. staying power and, yeah. And the denial of the self, right? Like just go back to Allah. If you're feeling tired, right. It's all just go pray and just yeah. like seek more help from Allah. And so feeling like this was weakness, right? Like that it was failure or weakness mm -hmm. more than it was like a natural consequence <laughs> of, you know, of my life and of, of my environment and everything else. Um, it was extremely overwhelming. And I really, I was the, oh God, doing that workshop, I was sweating. I have no, I don't, I was more embarrassed. Like afterwards, somebody came up to me though I, who I didn't, had never really seen me speak before when, you know, in this network. Cause that was the thing. I was like, some of these people I know and know me, but for the ones who have no reference point, like mm -hmm. this is how I'm introducing myself was so vulnerable. And so like, let me tell you my rock bottom story. Like, like, like I, it was so awful. Yeah. And so this one woman came up to me afterwards. She was like, I loved your presentation. Um, and I noticed like, you could use a little smoothing out and like there she like in, it, like suggested I go to a speaking workshop and I felt so like <laughs> well, she did not get the message well it was okay I but she again I, I get where she was coming from I and I only share it because I felt this you know it was like this deep like oh yeah man I would that that it was like holding up a mirror around I felt so unstable giving that workshop or so vulnerable and so like sweaty and you know again talking about like naked right like to be yeah. talking about my pain instead of yeah guys we can do this right like <laughs> was and that I could you know it was oh it was a lot and then I was just barely out of the woods it was yeah. still so fresh which is why I was resistant to doing it and thank god Soraya Ahudin who now runs Ampli she suggested that Sarah and I pair up to do it um, which was such a gift because it was so complimentary and she brought, um, yeah, she brought a different side to the conversation mm -hmm. that especially was focused on women of color, which is a different, you know, obviously mm -hmm. a different experience than I or you would have. Um, and that, yeah, that spoke to even more, you know, people and women in the room, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I was just, it was so sad. Like how many, like right on the spot after the workshop, the rest of that day, there was at least a handful of men and women who came to me and said, "Uh Oh, like it was, yeah, that there was, you know, like, uh Oh, and tell me about the books and all, you know, just the thirst for it. It was yeah. sad. And it was also really cathartic. Yeah. If I felt I went to Samaya and said, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for pushing me and having this idea. Um, yeah, because I also, I mean, once again, I felt empowered, right? Like mm -hmm. that all of this that I had been through and all of this figuring it out for myself and, and saving my own life, right? Like um, that I could share that with other people and be yeah. in service again. Like it started the next chapter. Um, and yeah, and it has shaped everything that has happened since. But my God, that was the most vulnerable, like public sharing that I have ever done. Y'all <laughs> uh, well, I feel so honored that I was there to witness it and, mm. and be transformed by it as well. Like mm, it was, that. it came across as incredibly moving and something I needed to hear. And mm -hmm. so thank you for that uh, a few years later. Yeah, um, for sure. So question for you, uh, now that, you know, you've gone through the roughest part, inshallah, there will not be inshallah. another part like that. What do you, what tools do you call upon? Do you use what's in your daily toolbox for mm -hmm. regulating your nervous system, for being balanced in your daily life, especially as a mother of two younger children? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm using the tools. They don't always work. They're tools. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, it's, um, it's a different kind of slowing down. Um, I, you know, there's the, the, the hardest part of it is not a daily thing is that, well, it is too, but it's the, it was the decision to live a different life. Mm -hmm. The hardest part, right? Like, and just like you, it's the decision to live a different life, to give, it felt like giving up one, it felt like giving up, right? Like <laughs> period giving up, uh, on activism, which mm -hmm. like, I don't know. They've, uh, like my relevance, my, all this work, like there's, uh, there's some sense of like ego, not even, I mean, not, I don't know. It's relevance, right? Like all of that stuff, like worth self-worth, not ego, self-worth. This is not a real tattoo. My daughter tattooed me. For oh, that's, those is that a Care Bear? Or, and, 
<laughs> something like something like that. Love like, it. yeah, just for anybody who's anti-tattoo. Um, <laughs> but the yeah, so I um making the choice to live a different life and to give myself permission to not be an activist um, and to not even retire activism, but re uh, advance to another chapter. Like it was, it, I had, that's what I came to was this has been a chapter and it was really hard to release that chapter um, because I, my self-worth, my identity, mm -hmm. my self-knowing, and even the affirmations really that came with it, you know, I mean, um, working in a team and working in a community, um, I got more affirmation, you know, as hard as that time was, I was affirmed on a regular basis. I, you know, it was a privilege to be affirmed and valued on a regular basis, even though it was grueling. Um, I knew, I always knew my, my job mattered, right? Like I knew my, uh, my days mattered and giving that up is what it felt like, like giving that up and choosing myself oh that felt so nefsy like uh for other for nefsy meaning like selfish right like for myself for myself like I'm choosing myself over mm -hmm. the work the activism the service that it's not a daily choice but I now it's still it's a daily reminder that I have to do is that I'm still in daily service like it's that was not the only way but it was just the only way that I knew for so long and it was so mm -hmm. valued and affirmed and so obvious right like but now taking the, yeah, and like reclaiming and going personal and, and repaving a path. Like I'm now working on a new project. Thank God. Um, and I, you know, when I, when I left activism and went into consulting, I, um, I was afraid nothing was ever going to be that good, that important, that soul filling just as much. As it was soul draining. It was also so gratifying to yeah. feel so useful. Um, and so, yeah, so I waited and prayed and waited and prayed in my daily practices. I'm still working on my five daily salat. It hasn't clicked yet, but I, um, I talk to Allah all the time and I start my days with a cup of coffee on the porch. Um, my kids know it's like co coffee, my coffee meditation time, which really is me sitting on the porch with my cup of coffee. And I play um, a morning of God or the good or a remembrance of God um, track from Omar Hashem. Um, and I, that's my morning meditation is not looking like not looking at the phone, but just sitting there with my coffee and starting the day in remembrance and listening to the birds and just trying to be present. That's a daily tool that I really, um, uh, when I don't do it, I don't feel centered. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I also have learned to breathe. I know that you, yeah, I have not gone through breathing classes, but, um, I, that my kids are outside you might be hearing them squeal through the open window but that's a sign of life um really fine. <laughs> exactly the, but i welcome. i have i have uh, all that physical pain also is in my head every day so i am called to move physically as often as possible and i when i'm stressed i you know now the sciatica is at like a one or a two every day it's on a scale of one to 10. I, you know, again, yeah. if you're a, a pain measurer, right. And then there are times where I'm like, Oh, I feel the ping, right. Where I just feel like when I'm driving, I feel a little bit more in my leg somewhere. Like, I'm like, Oh, there's like the three, right. Like it's just these little reminders. And then that's my call to, Oh, I haven't been walking every day or I haven't, you know, been going to yoga. I still, like, I try to, even if I don't go to yoga, stretching mm -hmm. has really become an important thing because of learning about the vagus nerve, which is kind of like your inner stick figure. There's one inner nerve that I love it. <laughs> it's that's the, when I looked at it, that's what I think about it as. And so stretching helps move that they call it your yeah. life nerve. I never knew all this stuff before this. I thought this was all Likewise, woo woo Adina. straight up thought it was woo woo. Like, <laughs> and then it's science. This is how Allah created us. Like I am trying to learn more about this body that Allah created. And that's this perfect design. And that it's, again, it's speaking to me. Every time I feel something, I'm like, Oh, what's it telling me? Sara in that workshop, she said, emotions are messengers that are trying to tell you something, which is something that she learned. And that is, that's the main tool that I use on a daily basis for my body is the emotions and, and sensations it's again, there's the, these are signals. And so the choice is whether I'm listening or I'm ignoring, 
or I'm again, diminishing like, right. And so it's paying attention to those things and then, um, feeding my body and soul every day a little bit, like it's yeah. And so, and I, so my supplement game, I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about physical movement. Um, I have mostly been in weekly therapy this whole time. Um, since my mom passed, I, uh, switched to a grief group, like a weekly grief group, um, talking and sharing with one person, a therapist or a support group is critical through Amply and Newground and every other fellowship program that I've been a part of insider out the power of circles, talking circles, healing circles, like it's, it's the feminine. And it's also like, uh, as old as time and that we, yeah, that our bodies connect and our, like, you know, I mean, with every, I see your life in Turkey and your liquor circles and music and all of this, just reacquainting myself with my body. Um, the uh, last thing I'll say too, is that I, hot water for me is, everything like so uh, water is very healing for me I grew up near the ocean in San Diego and so when I want to connect to Allah and I want to I like going to the beach is my is a blessing when I can do it um and so that helps but then on the other hand when I had the sciatica the only thing that would even give me temporary relief was insanely hot showers like in, yeah like the it, it, that it, somehow the heat would just like overwhelm right? Like once it's like when a baby's screaming and you scream to like interrupt, like that was, it's what that was. I don't know. That's what I can. That was the beginning of it was realizing that hot water, hot baths. And then now, um, like a jacuzzi, right? Like any submerged, I don't have a bath, a good bathtub at home. It's like too small to, yeah, to really get a good bath in it. Um, but the power of hot water and submersion, I know for some like, yeah, the ice cold water and all of that, but subhanAllah, God gives us the tools, right? And it's just re, yeah, like it's a different way of feeling into ourselves. So I spend a lot more time trying to feel every day. Well, I can relate so much to all of this, mm -hmm. Adina, and mm -hmm. so many of my practices are very similar to you. And it's going from a brain on a stick to being in the body. I mean, that's what it is. And listening to what it has to tell us, the emotions, sensations, pain, uh, what a beautiful messenger it can be to remind us to take care of ourselves better. So thank you for sharing all that. I'm sure it's very useful for people to hear what actual tools does someone like yourself use? So very practical, useful tools. To wrap up, uh, do you have any pearls of wisdom you want to share with people listening? So on the healing path, what would you like to share with them? What's some life lessons? Oh boy. Um, I mean, the hardest and the simplest is I, I want to go back to what you know, which is the power of breath. <clears throat> that if we are believers in God, then my, as my mentor, Dr. Myra too, taught me and so many of us that each of us are a singular breath of God, that God said be, and it is right. And so each of us, God said be, and so we were right. And so we're a breath of God and the breath that runs inside of us and outside of us is a connection between us and God. It's if we're a breath of God, our whole existence is a breath. And so going back to our breathing to reconnect to God and ourselves and our bodies feels like the most essential thing. Mm -hmm. And then I also have learned about the power of nose breathing. Yay, nose breathing. I'm so mad Stop that nobody through talks. your mouth. Yes. <laughs> nobody, I, that I, I'm so mad. Then like, again, these just like these basic, like how, like uh, tools for being in a body, things are not taught. Like mm -hmm. the, that, that when you breathe through your mouth, it's just like a uh, status quo basically. Yeah. <laughs> but when you breathe through your nose, you're sending that cleansing breath into your, into your bloodstream, mm -hmm. into your organs throughout your body, that it's working. Your whole body is working so much harder and it's an activating. I mean, I, yeah, I can't help but like make these motions because yeah that when all else fails, going back to the breath is going back to Allah. Um, the box breathing, the in for four, hold for four, out for four, hold for four, just doing that for three minutes can reset your nervous system. 
like so that you can at least find yeah like come to some kind of grounded place it may not be fully grounding but the longer that you do that again we have the tools within us um and what i spent my journey looking for was all of these tools outside. I was like, doctors, help me, help me, fix me in the therapy. Oh, and I forgot to mention EMDR, um, Mm -hmm. eye movement desensitization reprocessing is a therapeutic tool that uses your eye movement, um, which your eyes are connected to your brain. Again, this is all the body keeps the score. I, because I have learned about my body, I can use my body to heal my body, right? And heal my feelings. Um, the, the eyes are part of the brain. And so eye movement, lateral back and forth eye movement, while you're thinking about traumatic memories, um, can move them to the, the active part of your daily brain, move them from that side to the long-term memory side of your brain where it's not a part of your like daily vocabulary anymore. I call it the washing machine for the memories. Like Mm. it's a really incredible tool. And again, so it goes back to breath and it goes back to the reconnection with the body. So whatever way you can find time to sit with yourself, some people can't meditate, right? Like if you struggle with prayer, I even just, again, my morning coffee meditation, some form of stillness and just yeah. Stillness, breath, and being Presence, yeah. in your body, right? Like that's the most profound thing I can say. And the most simple thing. Um, and it doesn't have to be a lot. That's the thing. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a lot. Yeah. Well, thank you, Adina. I so appreciate uh, your vulnerability today. I mean, just in offering yourself and your story um, without censoring yourself, just being yourself mm-hmm. after a lifetime of censoring yourself, a lifetime of telling people what they want to hear. Like, it's just beautiful <laughs> to hear you, um, to, to hear your story on this path. And yeah. I really hope, and I really know that others will benefit from hearing it as well. So thank you for sharing and for being so open. Oh, it's a blessing. I thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so gratified and grateful to God because I, believed and trusted and prayed that in sharing that, you know, again, like that, yeah, that it would help others see themselves and help them give themselves permission to save themselves before they hit bottom. Like, Mm -hmm. and as we, yeah. So I, for anybody who has made it this far into this, (laughs) into this podcast, um, look me up, reach out. I'm on IG at uh, edlek, E-D-L-E-K and um, and, and reach out because we're in a sisterhood and we're in this journey together and aloneness is, is, yeah, is is one of the hardest ways to, to go through this. So know that you're not alone, whether you are physically or not. Yes. And I'll be adding her Instagram handles to the show notes if you need to find them. And Mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you, Rose.